Hello and welcome to another Tundra Connections webcast with Polar Bears International. My name is Elisa McCall and I'm the Director of Conservation Outreach and a Staff Scientist for Polar Bears International. And we are coming to you live from Tundra Buggy One on the shores of Hudson Bay. The wind is howling outside, it's snowing a little bit, and we have a sleeping polar bear just outside our window. It's been a really great week out here watching polar bears, which is extra special because it's polar bear week. So we're celebrating all sorts of cool things about polar bears this week. We have lots of live events, lots of media, and of course a couple great webcasts. So thank you so much for joining us today. Today we are talking about polar bear research, impacts and insights. We'll talk a bit about what we learn from polar bear research, how it impacts the bears, and kind of what the point of it all is. We do want your questions. If you have any questions for us, please put them in the chat box wherever you're watching. So if you're on polarbearsinternational.org, explore.org, or even Facebook, please do go ahead and type any questions in at any time and we'll answer as many as we can. We'll talk today for about 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how many questions we get. And then we'll say goodbye and we'll see you next time. So I'd like to enjoy, uh, introduce my panelists. John, John is our new Chief Research Scientist at Polar Bears International. John, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure thing. Hi everybody, so glad you could join us. Uh, my name is John Whiteman. Um, I'm the new Chief Research Scientist at Polar Bears International. I've been studying polar bears for about 15 years. Um, and I have long known PBI, but I'm very excited to have recently joined the team and to get opportunities like this to talk both about the methods that we use to study polar bears, some of the things that we've learned, and then where we're going in the future. So Churchill, where we are today, is a very special area. So we're just outside of Churchill, Manitoba right now. We are on a tundra buggy, of course. Uh, but the polar bears that we're watching and the bears outside our window right now, they're part of what we call the Western Hudson Bay polar bear subpopulation or population. And this is one of 19 different populations across the Arctic of polar bears. These polar bears are extra special because these are some of the best studied polar bears in the world. And part of why they are so well studied is because of their proximity or closeness to people. So we know every fall when we come to Churchill, we know we'll see polar bears. Polar bears would rather be out on the sea ice hunting seals but during the summer, Hudson Bay is ice free. The sea ice melts, so all the bears come onto land. And right now, in November, the bears are waiting for that sea ice to refreeze. It's gonna freeze back up soon. The bears will be gone as soon as it's frozen enough for them. Until then, we know they'll be here. And this really accessible area where we know we can travel to, we know we can see polar bears, we know we can ship equipment to, this makes polar bear research, um, well, it's never easy, but it's a little bit easier here than in other places. So these bears, because they're so well studied, they've given us over 40 years of data. These were the first polar bears where we were ever able to link climate warming and changes in sea ice to changes in the polar bear population. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I've been lucky enough to do some research here John has done research in very different areas that were a lot more difficult to get to. John, could you talk a little bit about the polar bear research you've done and what, kind of what a different situation that was than Churchill? Sure thing. So uh, in addition to doing work around here, I've done work up in um, northern Alaska in a place called the Beaufort Sea. And it's a little bit similar to this area in that it has some human uh, cities and some human settlements. They're not um, quite as accessible as Churchill. It's more difficult to get to. I also had the very rare opportunity to be able to go quite far north, um, almost all the way up to the North Pole on an icebreaker. And uh, we took some helicopters along with us on that journey on the icebreaker. We flew the helicopters off of the icebreaker and we were able to go out and sample polar bears that had followed the retreating sea ice north for the summer. And that was a really important study that we were able to do because uh, that area is so difficult to get to. No one had yet gone out and studied bears there, but it's a really, uh, it's a very common habit for polar bears from different parts of the Arctic to end up following the sea ice north for the summer. So it gave us some invaluable information that we could not have gotten otherwise, but it was definitely very difficult. Uh, we had to take a, uh, it was almost a 400 foot long ship, and we had to spend about five weeks breaking through ice to get up to our destination. So as John mentioned, there's really no other easy way to get information about polar bears. When people started studying polar bears back in the 70s, 80s, this is an animal that wants to live pretty far away from most people. It would rather be out on the Arctic sea ice hunting seals, their main prey. Arctic sea ice is an incredibly dangerous, cold 
expensive place to work, also dark, let's not forget that. Uh, so it's hard for researchers to understand polar bears, hard to even learn about their basic biology sometimes. So there are times and things we need to learn that we can only get by getting hands on with polar bears. So we want to talk a little bit about that today because when we do get hands on with any animal, we really want to and need to respect that animal. So we are going to get as much information as we can and treat that animal the best we can very quickly. And we are very sensitive to how what we do to animals might impact them and even impact the data that we learn from them. So we'll give you a couple examples. Um, John has done some neat work looking at one of the impacts on polar bears when it comes to research, which is kind of the helicopters. So when we have to work on polar bears, we dart them via helicopter. Uh, we put them to sleep for a short period of time to safely work on them. Um, but, you know, maybe a helicopter can be kind of stressful. And, John, mm -hmm. you've looked kind of more into that. Uh, maybe you could speak to that work. Sure thing, yeah. So as we've been talking about, the, the area around here is just really remote. And in almost all of polar bear habitat, their whole range, it's just very remote. And it's difficult to be able to consistently get out onto the sea ice and do something like set a live trap that a bear could wander into and then you could close the door and then go get the samples that you would need from that bear. It's really hard to do out on the sea ice. So almost everywhere that we study polar bears, the only option, the only viable option, is to fly in a helicopter, um, find a bear, uh, fly the helicopter kind of low, and then shoot it with a dart that contains some immobilization drug. Uh, and then that will help the bear go to sleep, usually within something like five to seven minutes. And then you can safely land the helicopter, take some samples, maybe put a collar on the bear so you can track its location. So, like we, we were just talking about a moment ago, it's almost kind of like human medicine, where the first thing you want to say is do no harm. I mean, if the whole point of what we're doing here is conservation research, that we're, our goal is to help polar bears, we really don't want to do anything that's going to harm them. So we need to be real careful and make sure that we understand well what the impacts are of something like uh, the helicopter process to get close enough to a bear to be able to shoot it with the dart. Uh, and so one of the things that I've done is evaluate polar bear activity and then also their body temperature both during their natural behavior, so I studied that over a period of several months where the bears were just out on the sea ice living their normal lives and they had small loggers that were recording their body temperature and that also were recording their levels of activity. And then we also recorded those same data during the process of a helicopter coming close and then darting the bear and then the bear becoming immobilized. And when we were able to compare those pieces of data, what we found is that, uh, let's see, it was in five out of six bears that we had good body temperature data on. Five out of those six bears actually experienced higher body temperatures and some more um, uh, uh, high body temperatures that would be associated with really high activity, like if you were exercising a lot, uh, during their natural behavior, more so than they experienced during capture. And then similarly, for three out of five bears, we found that they had their highest activity levels during natural behavior, not when they were being um, chased by a, a helicopter as part of the capture process. So that ended up telling us that the things that polar bears do during their natural behavior, they can do some really intense things, like they might get into fights with each other, or they can have a really intense predation event where they chase a seal and have to capture it. And some of those things that they're doing during their natural behaviors are just as kind of vigorous and as intense, if not more vigorous or more intense, as the process of being uh, sampled and then, or I'm sorry, being captured and then sampled for research. Yeah, and that research is so important. It's something, you know, we've wondered about for ages when using these helicopters, but a polar bear's life is so stressful anyway mm. um, that as long as we can, uh, yeah, be efficient at our research, then we know that we're mm. not having any more of an impact than we need to. John, you mentioned an immobilization drug. Mm -hmm. uh, we use a very specific type of drug for mm -hmm. very specific reasons, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can tell people a little bit about what we use and why. Sure thing. So when people started doing polar bear research around 34 years ago, there's a lot of effort put towards figuring out what is the best kind of drug that you can use with a polar bear that'll be very safe. And the drug that ended up becoming quite commonly used is one called telazole. And this drug was selected for a couple different reasons. One is that the dosing is very safe, so it's really hard to overdose a bear on telazole. A second thing is that it has what's called a smooth induction. And that just means that when the drug starts to take effect, it's fairly quick, but it's gradual. And basically it just causes the animal to stop walking, 
and then usually they sit first, so they sit down, butt down on the ground like a dog first, and then they'll kind of lay down on their chest like that, and then they'll be out. Um, and then the last thing is, is that the drug isn't too long lasting, and so it lasts just long enough basically to get the research done that you need, and then the drug starts wearing off, and uh, then the, you can leave, you can safely leave the capture site, and then the bear will resume its activity pretty quickly, and it will get back actually to full activity within, depending on the bear and the scenario, something like within a couple days, the bear will be 100% back to its normal behavior, normal activity. And you mentioned to me earlier, someone did a follow-up looking at maybe was it the, the heart or impacts on the, the cardio system of the bear? Yeah, so with all of these drugs, I mean, it's the same thing in human medicine. If you're ever working with drugs with an animal, you want to be real careful um, because if the animal is immobilized, you need to make sure that their breathing is normal, their heart rate is normal, uh, and there's none of their basic function that is being impaired. And so this drug, there's been a couple follow-up studies that have validated that when a bear becomes immobilized with telazole, its breath rate is normal, its heart rate is normal, and it's not having any problems maintaining its normal physiological function. So then when it starts to wake up, it basically wakes up right where it left off. Right. So we know this drug is safe, which is fabulous, and that makes it safe for researchers as well. Mm -hmm. um, Another type of research we do, well, it, it kind of fits into what you've already talked about, the helicopter and the drug, but the tracking. People really wonder, you know, they'll sometimes see pictures of polar bears with collars. Um, we talk about tracking data a lot, and what is the impact that a collar mm -hmm. would have on a polar bear? Because it, sometimes it looks a little, you know, looks different. Right. Um, is that collar bothering the bear, or what do we know about that? There's also been a fair amount of work studying the effects of things like putting collars on bear. And the punchline is, so far we haven't seen any negative effects. There's been a lot of bears that have been sampled over the last 30, 40 years. A lot of collars have been deployed. Uh, and thus far what we've been able to tell is the survival and the longevity um, and the behavior of bears isn't being negatively impacted. So now we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we've learned from this research. And I should point out, too, when we talk about polar bear research, uh, particularly with helicopters and darting, this is not something that happens all year round in all the polar bear populations. This is really something, um, this type of research happens in certain populations. Some are just way too difficult to get to. And it happens very seasonally, so these very short periods of time. Uh, for example, out here in Churchill, we see polar bear researchers come out for a few weeks every September or late August, and then again for a few weeks in February, March. Uh, sometimes not even that, depending on <laughs> how funding goes. Um, and then similar up in the high Arctic, you know, it's seasonal. And it's, it's very short, these short windows of time where we know we can access polar bears and, you know, it's expensive, it's dangerous, and we don't need to be uh, looking at the bears all year round. So these are short windows. But we have learned so much. Again, this bear wants to be far away from us. They're really hard to learn about. What have we learned from what we've done with these bears? And how do we make it worth it that we are studying polar bears? So one of the things we've learned, we were able to show, because this polar bear population here has such incredible data, uh, data on numbers, data on body size and cubs and size of the cubs and mom health, we were able to first show in this population here the impacts of climate warming due to loss of sea ice. So we were only able to do that because we had incredible data from that type of research work. So these bears here are really teaching us about the broader species and teaching us what happens when our world keeps warming and polar bears are losing their Arctic sea ice home. And that is so important. We can't have effective conservation measures if we don't have good science to back that up, if we don't understand what's going on. Better understanding leads to better conservation outcomes. Um, but we let's circle back to tracking for a minute. So kind of John talked about how we, we know that the tracking isn't impacting the bears negatively. And on the flip side, it has told us maybe more about polar bears, especially their movements, than anything ever could have. Polar bears have massive home ranges, which we know from tracking. Um, and John, maybe, you could, yeah, you could talk a little bit about all the things we've learned from being able to, to know where polar bears go on the ice. Sure thing. So, uh, you know, people have lived in the Arctic for a very long time, and it's always been clear that uh, these are bears that really prefer the sea ice. But it wasn't until uh, the advent of modern satellite tracking that, we're, that when people were able to put collars on bears and get continuous data year-round, including them in the months where it's pitch black and you can't see anything because the sun is down all winter, and the bears are tens or hundreds of kilometers away from the shore, out where there aren't really any people to be able to observe them. 
once that technology came on board and we were able to start collecting locations year round from these bears and in really far flung places, the first thing that happened is it just became abundantly clear that their name, Ursus maritimus, or sea bear, or ocean bear, is just, a, it's the perfect name for them because they will do everything and anything they can to spend their time out on the sea ice. That truly is their home. The second thing that became clear is that bears have certain areas that they prefer. So it's not that we have one single large population of polar bears that's just always roaming wherever they want all the way around the Arctic. Instead, we have these 19 distinct subpopulations that are really separated on the basis of movement. So a bear that got a collar, for example, here in western Hudson Bay, there's a very good chance, we learned from the collar data, that that bear would spend its whole life in the western Hudson Bay area. It might mate and produce cubs in this area, and then it would finish its life in this area. And then the cubs that uh, it was able to produce, those cubs would grow up in this area and do the same thing. So we now have a much better appreciation for the fact that we have these different subpopulations around the Arctic. And that's a really important thing to learn because as we're projecting into the future and trying to understand how polar bears are responding to the widespread changes we're seeing around the world and in the Arctic, we need to understand that there's going to be maybe different responses in different parts of the Arctic that are specific to each one of those subpopulations. And as the sea ice keeps changing, we can look at maps of Arctic sea ice, daily maps, and overlay polar bear locations on those maps and combine that information. Polar bears are this animal that their habitat is literally changing under their feet every day. It's shifting and moving and melting and freezing. And there's not a lot, well, terrestrial animals don't deal with it the same way. They, of course, have seasons too, but imagine your home changing its landscape all the time. So this tracking data is so helpful for us. It also can help show us when polar bears are swimming. So we get an idea of if they're swimming longer more often, which they are in some areas, uh, and just kind of, yeah, knowing what they're up to all the time. It's such interesting work. We could talk about tracking for a long time. Check out our bear tracker if you haven't. We're, we've added new bears this year, and we're going to start tracking them really soon here, adding locations to the map. You yourself can follow polar bears on Hudson Bay all winter long along with us. We update that map weekly uh, starting pretty soon. So a great example of tracking data and learning more about the bears. John has also done a lot of really incredibly interesting physiology studies. Um, John, you know a lot about how polar bear bodies work and what they need from some of the work you've done. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that sort of work on polar mm -hmm. bears as well. So there's also been um, really important data that we've been able to collect, not just about the whole population or where they're occurring on the map or where they're roaming, but also about how the individual animals work. And some of that information, for example, is included that polar bears have this very unusual diet where they really prefer to eat seals, but not only seals, they really prefer to eat the fat of their seal. So the diet might be up to like 80% fat, which sounds terrible, and for us, for humans, it would be terrible. That would be a very unhealthy choice. Um, but it turns out that polar bears are very well adapted to that kind of diet, and it's something we would not have known had we not been able to sample and work with individual polar bears. You know, and as we're looking at that video of the sleeping polar bear outside, whoop, and he just raised his head as I talked about him. Um, as we're uh, looking at that polar bear outside, this also reminds me of a really interesting fact that we've learned um, from studying some polar bears in captivity, and that is we don't yet know how cold it needs to get to make a polar bear shiver. And that, again, just kind of drives home the idea that the Arctic truly is the home for polar bears. There's nowhere else than out in the cold, frozen sea ice that is a really good home for them. They are so well adapted to the cold temperatures that we just, as far as we know, they've been monitored down into temperatures into the minus 30s Fahrenheit and Celsius, and we have yet to hit a temperature in a situation where a polar bear ends up needing to shiver because it got too cold. That is so interesting. I get that question all the time. I never know how to answer it, and it's because we don't know. Yeah. We still have a lot left to learn about polar bears. If anyone out there is interested in polar bear research, you could absolutely come on board and help us learn more about the species. It's not easy, but it's sure fun and interesting. Now, John, you mentioned uh, researching captive bears, so I did want to touch on that for a minute. We do work with a network of zoos and aquariums that have polar bears, and if a zoo or aquarium is going to have a polar bear, we want to make sure that polar bear has a standard of care, that people know how to speak properly about climate change and polar bears and basically contribute to the conservation of the wild cousins of that bear. But one way that zoos can help us so much is by helping us learn more about polar bears in ways we could not in the wild. So one example of this learning about um, energetics, and John, maybe you can speak to this, is we mm -hmm. actually 
parked with a zoo that had um, a treadmill, a polar bear on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what did we learn from that? How do, how do we do that? <laughs> so those were those were very interesting studies, yeah. and it wasn't an exercise study. We weren't, you know, giving this yeah. bear a running assignment on the yeah. treadmill and asking it to, you know, no try. PE class for polar bears. No PE yeah. class for the polar bears. <laughs> Um, but the, the broad question that's really important for wild animals in general is energy balance. Mm -hmm. So an animal can't just go down to the grocery store and get food when it gets hungry, right? It always needs to seek out its food out on the landscape. And then in, in the case of polar bears, it needs to find seals. It needs to be able to capture the seal. And so that is hard to do and it requires a lot of energy. And so a, a polar bear always needs to be balancing the amount of energy that it's spending trying to obtain its food. Um, versus how much energy it's able to get from the food once it catches the, that food. So we talked a little bit about some of the stuff that we've learned about how polar bears prefer fat in their diet. And one of the reasons for that is because fat has so much energy inside of it, it really makes those meals worth it once they catch the animal. The other side of that equation is how much energy do they have to spend, for example, walking around on the surface of the sea ice, covering these huge distances while they're looking for seals. And one of the only ways to get a good handle on the energy cost for that is to put a polar bear on a treadmill, monitor their oxygen consumption, which is a reflection of how much energy you're using. And you kind of probably already know that if you have ever taken really deep breaths after taking a run, that means that your body is using more oxygen because you're using more energy. So when you put a polar bear on a treadmill and the polar bear starts walking on that treadmill, you can measure the amount of oxygen being consumed and you can relate that back to how quickly it's walking on the treadmill. And that helps us understand how much energy polar bears are burning when they're walking around out on the sea ice and then how many seals it is that they need to catch in order to stay in balance. Yeah. Really important stuff to know, mm -hmm. again, for the conservation of the species. And another important thing about all this research, we have all these techniques that are really important and that contribute to polar bear conservation and understanding. And there's a lot of things that we will continue doing. But it's also important that we're always looking to improve and always looking for ways to learn more, less invasively even. So how can we do less and learn more? I wanted to show one example. So we talked about the collars earlier, tracking collars. Uh, polar Bears International is working on a new way to track polar bears. So collars can only be put right now on adult female polar bears. Males, their necks are too big compared to their skull. They can pull the collar off. We don't want to put a collar on a growing polar bear. But one option we have, uh, working with 3M engineers, our, our colleague BJ Kirschhofer led this study for us and is currently still working on it. Uh, we're looking at a way to attach a fur tracking device to polar bear fur. The idea being that polar bears do molt in the spring and that the device would fall off naturally and that this could be used on males and on younger polar bears, which would really fill some gaps for us. So this is an example a prototype of how we would stick, um, there would be a tracker glued here to this this uh, hyperlon piece. Hyperlon, is that that's what hyperlon, it's called? Hyperlon, yep, it's a yep. very tough material. Very tough, used in Zodiac boats. Um, and then simply the, the fur is threaded through it, and so it sticks in there very, very nicely. We get GPS locations from it, it doesn't bother the bear, and eventually it rubs off on the sea ice. Um, so less invasive, uh, shorter term, so maybe not quite as robust data, but still important data. And data that fills in, again, these gaps of males and younger bears. We're testing a couple different options there you see on your screen. We have a couple prototypes. And this is another thing that our, um, our captive partners, some of our zoo partners, are helping us put these on their zoo bears so we can learn more about how they work. Um, yeah, and make them more effective. So the, everything we're doing is in the name of polar bear understanding, polar bear conservation, uh, and research is just, it's so important and interesting and we're very fortunate that we get to be in that world. Um, I'm going to take a few questions now and then we'll start to wrap up. Thank you so much for sending in questions, John. I'm gonna throw a few to you. Sure. Um, Let's see, there was, oh yeah, well someone does say there is a mom in this area right now with a collar. There's a mom with a cub and a collar. They look healthy, we saw them yesterday. She's looking good, we hope to see them again. It's actually the first mom and cub we've seen in this area this season, so that's exciting. So please do keep an eye out on the polar bear cams uh, for her. So John, when will the sea ice freeze up and the polar bears will leave? Like how long are they sticking around for? Oh, that's a good question. So it's been pretty warm up here. Um, today is nice and cold. It's around, uh, it's minus 10 Celsius, which I think it's about 10 to 12 or so Fahrenheit. Um, and so things are freezing up a little bit right now, which is great. But the, the Hudson Bay body of water is so big that just because we have a day or two of cold weather doesn't mean the whole thing's gonna freeze over. Mm -hmm. So sometime in the coming weeks, it's hard to predict exactly. 
Um, but I think, uh, so sometime in the coming weeks and the absolute latest, we should expect there to be enough ice and for the bears to leave by mid-November, late November, sometime, somewhere, somewhere in there. But uh, that's one of, the th one of the interesting reasons to keep watching the polar bear tracker and keep checking these cameras because it's a little bit unpredictable on a day-to-day -day basis of when, it's gonna get, of when exactly it's going to happen. We have another question. Uh, do polar bears see humans as food? Um, I'll take that one and I'll say no. I will say polar bears are very curious and highly intelligent. And in many areas of their range, we are forcing them to spend longer periods of time on land. That's making the bears hungrier and making them a little more likely to follow their noses into a community, finding garbage, finding attractants that they shouldn't be at. Um, but it does happen that polar bears wander near communities. It has happened that people have been injured or killed by polar bears, but inherently we are not food to polar bears. Uh, we, they're not trying to hunt us out here. They're not actively seeking us as food. They very much want to be eating seals. Number one, they want to be out there on that sea ice. And it's important that we protect their sea ice habitat so the bears can stay out on the ice and we can stay safe in our communities, keeping both species safe and separate. And at the end of this broadcast, in just a few minutes, we're going to play you a lovely video explaining all of that and ways that you can get involved. But I will say right now, one of the biggest things you can do is talk. Talk to friends and family. Shift these conversations about climate and protecting our resources to be so normal in our society. Together we can shift our social discourse. We can influence where our energy comes from. We need to reduce our fossil fuel emissions and use, and we have the options. We have solar, we have wind, we have the renewables we need to use more of to keep polar bears on the ice and to keep people you know, with also a protected future as well. So just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, what? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is great. The questions are mostly about what we can do to help polar bears. But John, there is one question we actually talked about earlier. Sure. Do polar bears dream? Oh, we were just we chatting were about so this, yeah. watching that sleeping polar bear. Yeah. Um, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, the slightly longer answer is um, I would sure bet. Yeah. <laughs> what they dream about, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Um, but, you know, they do, they have uh, uh, sleep patterns like a lot of other animals do. So, you know, it's always, you, you don't want to anthropomorph, you don't want to uh, look at uh, animals as, um, as people. You don't want to anthropomorphize is the term. Um, and you also don't want to look at a wild animal as something like your pets at home, right? But there are some things that are a little bit in common. And so if you've ever seen your dog or your cat taking a nap and maybe it's twitching in its sleep, looking like it's dreaming, mm -hmm. I would sure guess that polar bears do something similar. Mm -hmm. Another area of future study, perhaps. And last question is, uh, could that mom with a collar be identified from her collar info? The answer is yes. And we're currently working on getting that info for you. And we'll share it um, on our website and on explore.org when we find out who she is and who her cub is. Um, with that, we'll start to wrap up. Thank you, John, for being with us today. It was so interesting to learn more about polar bear research. Thank you to the viewers at home for joining our Tundra Connections webcast, especially during Polar Bear Week. Please hang out with us more this week and next week. We have more events. We've got lots of social media, more webcasts, live chats, a lot of really fun stuff going on. So check it out. Big thank you to explore.org. The polar bear cams, there's polar bear cams spread out throughout the tundra. They're live streaming all the time. There's been some incredible things captured on these cams in the last couple days. Yesterday we saw a polar bear stalking a seal. But of course the bear didn't have ice. The seal was in the water taunting the bear. And the bear was stalking it up and down the coast. It was one of the best things I've seen out here. And you could see it too. It's, it's on a clip on YouTube. And keep watching those polar bear cams. Big thanks to Frontiers North Adventures. They give us buggy one every fall and allow us to use this amazing vehicle to roam around and bring polar bears to you. We could not do this without them. And for teachers or parents out there, please do take our feedback survey if you can. The link should be sent to you if you registered, should be in the chat somewhere. It really does help us inform our programming. And if you'd like to check out more of our resources, we have some great curriculum, materials, units, lessons, math, art, all sorts of great stuff on our website. We also have fabulous resources on Microsoft Flip. So if you like Microsoft Flip, check us out there. And we also are trying to get a Lego Buggy One version created. So if you're into Lego, uh, you should also see a link to that somewhere. We are trying to get boats to get Lego Buggy One as a kit so we can all have our very own Buggy One at home. How cool would that be? 
So please, as we wrap up, remember to follow your curiosity, uh, find your community. We're going to work together. We're going to we're going to make sure we have a shared future. But it's going to take us holding our leaders accountable and becoming the leaders that the world needs for us and for polar bears. So we're going to wrap up with a wonderful video, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. A polar bear's life cycle is almost exclusively tied to the sea ice. Because polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt, to breed, and sometimes to den, sea ice loss from climate change is their biggest threat, and the reason the bears are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list of threatened species. What we learn about climate change impacts on polar bears in Hudson Bay can be applied across the Arctic to help conserve other populations. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth, trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. When Arctic waters are cold enough, the top layer freezes into a special type of ice called sea ice. Sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. It supports the entire Arctic food chain. Food from this marine ecosystem also sustains northern communities. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the way it should and to preserving a future for polar bears across the Arctic is to move away from using fossil fuels for energy altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.